Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 23rd, 2014, and this is the week in charts. Well, I know I say this every week, but come on, guys. Take a look at the overall market. Take a look at what's going on. As you can probably figure out, I have a lot to cover. So normally I get a little jacked up on Mountain Dew, but I, I've been um, forgetting to buy some or uh, put it on the grocery list. So it uh, looks like uh, we're going to be using a little community coffee again this week. Oh, that's good stuff. Make us a Mountain Dew and community coffee. Community coffee do not um, sponsor me, but hey, if you're out there, give me a shout out. Maybe I'll contact community. Being a local boy, they might um, they might throw me a bone. Um, that was a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up, make your life a little easier. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, this is part of the show where I beg for a review. I won't spend too much time begging this week, don't worry. But if you get a chance, you read the book, you like the book, put me up a review on Amazon.com. I get a lot of emails from people, oh, probably five times as many as there are reviews up there, saying, hey, Dave, love the book. I'm like, great. Could you put me a review? And then I never hear back. Um, it, it won't hurt to put a review. And the reason I ask is because some people are malignant and review the reviews, and it really just makes me angry. All right, enough of that nonsense. What are we talking about today? Uh, I want to talk about understanding the usual suspects. When you look at a price bar chart, a lot of times there's like a magic or a mystique about it, and, and people forget there are people behind the bars, and we're going to flesh that out in a lot more detail uh, in a few minutes. I want to continue to talk about emerging trend patterns. I left my charts in from a couple of weeks ago because uh, I think it's going to be kind of interesting to continue to look at those and then – when we jump forward to the live chart, see how things are shaking out or not shaking out. Uh, talk a little bit about elevator, uh, elevators, um, elevators and escalators, and that'll make sense in a few more minutes. We have another dead money report again this week. So I love um, the fact that the market, not all the time, but often plays out to – to my methodology, to the things I preach all the time. Not that I'm the only one out there preaching this, but it's kind of cool to see things that I always preach, like not micromanaging play out, money management play out, trailing and scaling, and, and all these other things. And it's kind of really cool as it plays out. And that's why I end up beating a dead horse on a lot of these issues, because human nature never changes. Every time I get a new client, I get the same exact questions over and over again. Dave, they're coming out with earnings. What should I do? Nothing. Dave, what about Ebola? What should I do? Nothing. <laughs> we'll get to that in just one second. Anything you want me to talk about, start thinking about now. When we do get to the charts, if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time and then hit your carriage return or inner key, whatever they call it nowadays and uh, I'll be happy to cover those stocks. So just hold off on individual stocks until we get to the charts. And then, again, just put one stock on a line and hit carriage return. So I won't. Uh, if you put six stocks on one line, I, I, I'm, it's going to be hard for me to keep up which ones I covered and which one I, I didn't. Anyway, um, this morning's column, I talked about the usual suspects. And uh, I see a note here, great column this morning looking at the indices. Today, it looks like the water is fine again for the bulls, but we know better, smiley face, and that's Fred. Yeah, and that's the thing. Uh, we're going to get into deep retraces in just one second, and the nature of a bull versus a bear market or a down versus up market, however you want to look at it. you got to be careful not to name, uh, uh, to name or label yourself as a bull or a bear, because as conditions change, you're a little slow to change, and you might get a little too caught up in your beliefs. And you have to believe in what you see and not in what you believe. And, and markets can have pretty serious deep retraces. Now, before I jump too far ahead of myself, let's talk about the usual suspects when it comes to markets and the importance of understanding the players that are out there. Not that you could necessarily profit directly from them because you don't know what they're going to do. But you can read the charts and figure out what has been done 
and what they might likely do. Now, the genesis of this morning's column is from a speech, or the beginning of a speech at least, that Tom McClellan gave last year at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting. And Tom got up there and he started out by saying that when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship with the company. And that makes sense. And you're expecting that company to do great things, to, to not cook the books and, to, and for the CEO to behave. Not that that always happens, but yeah, obviously CEO doesn't always behave, um, which I actually wrote about in Layman's and the day it, it got published, the CEO was not behaving. But as a general statement, 99.9% .9 of the time the, the CEO behaves, or 99% of the time at least, and they don't cook the books. And they they do what they should do. And they they work hard to make as much money as they can. So you form a relationship with them, and you expect them to do good things and do the right thing. And for the most part, they do. But what you fail to realize, and as technical analysts, we we speak from our soapbox. And but it helps. It, it that's one thing great about becoming a member of this organization is. We spend a lot of time, and, and we preach it to the choir. We're preaching to the choir, but we spend a lot of time talking about technical analysis, and and not just the 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 oscillator or the moving average or the bow tie or whatever the pattern may be, but we spend some time talking about whys of the whys of technical analysis. And sometimes it does help to, to step back to simple things, like Tom said. And Tom says, you're forming a relationship with the company. And that makes a tremendous amount of sense. But Tom went on to say that you also are forming a relationship with anyone who has bought the stock prior to, to you. And those people will screw you. Now, before I, dig I digress too far, quick story, and I've told this before, but I'll tell it again. Dick Fruth, who um, he's got a book out. Uh, it's on Kindle. You can get it. Uh, I think it's Parabolic Trends in Stocks. I'll have to get the exact name for it. And uh, he's a good guy, Dick. And uh, he was telling me, and he writes in the book, that he's been around long enough to where when he was a broker um, aspiring to – to move up the ranks, instead of just being a broker, he would form relationships with his clients. And if the clients came in to sell a stock, and back in those days, you would actually come in, you actually had shares. You would actually walk in with uh, some shares in your hands, um, which is kind of cool. By the way, I've, I collect them, I sort of collect them. I've got a bunch of them. I bought a bunch on eBay, and I got them on the walls of my office. And they're they're really beautiful, and they're kind of cool to uh, collect and I'd suggest you get a get a just get a couple just so you have uh, some of some of them some of them if even just for nostalgic purposes but it kind of reminds you that it's a piece of paper and it's not necessarily the company and and it, it's good to have that physical reminder but anyway Dick's point was that these people were selling the stock 99% of the time the reason they were selling had nothing to do with the stock itself. They got a divorce, or they had a kid in college, or they want to buy a new car, or they want to do something with that money. And that's why they're selling the stock to raise money. So if you think about these people that are out there, and like Tom said, he goes, you're forming a relationship not only with the company, with those people, and those people will screw you. And they're not out to get you. And a lot of people personalize the market, and that's dangerous because the market's not out to get you. The market exists, okay? If you don't have any positions on, the market doesn't care whether you have any positions on or not, and it doesn't affect you psychologically one way or the other. But as soon as you have positions on, all of a sudden things begin to change, okay? And you become a little bit emotionally attached. And you got to realize that there's a lot of players out there that can screw things up, okay? And I thought of a few of them this morning, about a half a dozen. There's probably 
about a half a dozen more that I'm leaving out, but you kind of get the idea. First of all, you got the Fed. And like I said in the column this morning, the Fed used to be a uh, kind of like a, I want to use the word arbiter, but, but I'm trying to think of a better way of putting it. They just sort of kept things in balance. They didn't let things get too far one way or too far the other. They kept order, okay, to the markets. They would loosen up a little bit on interest rates when the time came and bump the brakes a little bit when the time uh, came along to do these things. And they kept the market in order. And then at some point in time, I guess in 2009, the modus operandi became quantitative easing and quantitative easing two and quantitative easing three and quantitative easing infinity. So for some reason, instead of letting the markets be markets, which I'm a big fan of, and I think the markets will take care of themselves, okay? But at some point, they decided that we're just going to floor it. We're just going to step on the gas, okay? Or as a friend of mine, friend of ours says, gas. We're going to step on the gas. She spells gas, G-A-Z, or she pronounces it G-A-Z. Anyway, so they're just going to step on the gas is what they're going to do. And that's worked to some extent, but I quoted Rob Hannon this morning in my column. And Rob's a good guy. I pick on him a little bit. He picks on me too. Um, and, and he also said at the same meeting that the Fed's money or Fed intervention has been like a drug. And initially it just took a little bit, a little bit of money to get the market moving. And I think it's the perception of the Fed that we had back years ago. Oh, the Fed's accommodating. That's fine. Don't fight the Fed. I understand. So let's – um, we probably want to be in this buying environment. And the Fed has kept their credibility. But through the printing of the money over the years and the throwing of the money at the, at the, at the markets, the quantitative easing and all, I think they've lost some credibility. And Rob was saying that – like a drug, it just took a little bit of a, a little bit of a bump from the Fed to get the moving, to get the market moving. But now it's taken more and more and more, and we have reached a point of diminishing returns. And that was about a year ago. It'd be interesting to get some updated um, um, research from Rob on that. Now I'll, I'll contact him and uh, and see what he has to say about that. Um. So you got the Fed out there, and they could obviously they could really muck things up. And the problem, what scares me is you can't sit around thinking about this all day and all night. And I know there's a lot of other people that, that fight the good fight. And I think at some point you have to let it go. But it is a little scary to think that at some point they're not going to be able to manipulate the market any further. And at that point, we're going to see the mother of all sell-offs. Now, recently, I'm beginning to worry that, or concerned, I should say, that we might be seeing that. And I haven't done anything drastic other than follow what the database is telling me to do, take some shorts, and then on those, wait for entries, honor your stops. You know the routine. We'll get to that when we talk about the portfolio in a few seconds. So it's kind of scary uh, that the Fed could, could muck things up a little bit in here. And I guess that could go both ways. If the if the Fed loses credibility, the market could sell off really hard. And if the Fed comes in and just keeps trying to save things, it could really buck up your short side position. So that's one of the players that could certainly screw you. Uh, you got bargain hunters are out there, and then when the market begins to drop, they rush in and try to buy it. The problem is, if it turns right back down, they could be a little fickle, and they could sell and dump right in. A lot of times, you know, raise your hand if you've ever been short a stock, got squeezed out, and then, of course, that it begins to tumble. Well, that's because these these players are, are screwing you on your deal. They're screwing you out of a perfectly good position. Douglas once said, and I, and I talk about this quite often, too. I, I beat the dead horse so much on all this stuff. But Douglas once said, and I've got a cassette tape of him here uh, somewhere uh, buried in my office, and he said at one of the tag conferences, he said that all it takes is one trade to screw up a perfectly good trade. 
And it's true. Let's say that you're, you've got to stop at a certain level and somebody comes in and, and, and fat fingers in the water or does something stupid or uh, a big hedge fund or something has to get out, and all of a sudden it pushes the price past your stop and you get taken out of the trade. So never forget that. All it takes is one, and he wasn't very kind about it, but one, let's say, a-hole to <laughs> screw up a perfectly good trade. you got the buy and hope crowd, or they buy and hold and hold on forever. The problem with the buy and hope uh, crowd is what happens if they need money? Then they become the this guy, the need the money part. And it's also the fast money, too. Fast money, I put slash need the money. Uh, these guys are interchangeable. These guys, obviously, except for the Fed, they all sort of change change hats, or they could be seen as interchangeable. Uh, but the need the money is like somebody who needs money for one of the aforementioned reasons, a divorce or kid going to school or buy a car or whatever the case may be. Uh, the fast money is the money that tends to chase their own tail. NASDAQ has its biggest day of the year. The media gets excited. It makes a big deal. They rush out and buy stocks. What happens yesterday after they bought stocks at the end of Tuesday? Well, they dump them on Wednesday. And now, church of what's happening now, maybe they're jumping right back in. Okay? So that could screw things up. Uh, you have to confuse the issue with facts. If you ever get confused, www. Do not and don't. Either one will work. D O N T. No apostrophe. Confuse. F U S E. The issue with facts. I have a fetish when it comes to domains. I collect domains. And that's one of my many domains that I have. Somebody was asking me, well, which ones do you have? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea, but I got a lot of them. Marketing to bed is one. Uh, anyway, I do own these two domains down here. So if you get confused, go to www. Do not confuse the issue with facts. And the confusing of the issue with facts, we're going to flesh that out in just one minute. And that's when you are looking at the earnings of a company and saying, well, the earnings are great, fundamentals are great, but you're forgetting the fact that you're confusing the issue with facts. You're trying to justify why the stock or the market should be going up. And like Greg Morris pointed out in his book, the, the market will only allow, or fun, the greatest fundamentals will only allow, uh, the trend will only allow, Shoot, how did he say that? Excuse me. Um, I couldn't hit my mute button quick enough. <laughs> um, the market will only – oh, I'll find a quote. Anyway, basically he's saying that what the trend will allow, whatever the trend will of the market will allow is based on – the is not based on the fundamental. We're going to have to rewind all this. <laughs> Maybe the community coffee has more caffeine than the, uh, than the Mountain Dew. So you confuse the issue with facts, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that when we get to earnings. But it's only what the trend will allow. The greatest fundamentals in the world are only as good as what the trend will allow. I think that's how he said it. Now that I butchered up his uh, thing. Frenchy says, supposedly a free market, but should they just let the market crash? Well, that's where it gets a little difficult, okay? And um, I've gotten into some interesting arguments with people, discussions, I should say. And, and – I have been swayed to to understand, okay, I, I hear, you know, they, they say that you can't just let a market crash, it, it, that sometimes the Fed's got to come in and do a little bit. And, and that's happened over the years, and that's that's been fine, but it seems like the problem that we have now, the hole that we dug for ourselves, is that they, they didn't come in and, and kind of tap the brakes and say, not tap the brakes, but you know what I'm saying, put a step on the gas a little bit to try to slow the market's descent and try to bring order to the market. They're no longer bringing order to the market. They're bringing manipulation to the market. Now, again, we could stay up all night worrying about this, or we could just follow the charts. But the point I'm trying to make here is just know that all these players can muck up a perfectly good trade, okay? 
Frenchie says, where can we get a copy of the stock certificates that hang on the wall? Um, eBay is a good place to get. You just get canceled ones. Um, if you want to be a true collector uh, of the, um, there's a word for when you collect, I don't know if it's notes too, but when you collect uh, old paper, there's a word for it, and it escapes me at this moment. And if somebody knows the, the name for that, uh, let me know. Scriptology, scribology, um, it's something. And you could Google that, whatever that term is, if somebody tells me what it is. Google stock certificates and, and the word will come up. Uh, and it's usually the category they're listed under. It escapes me at the moment. But uh, if you Google that, you could actually find ones that aren't canceled. And maybe you could find some ones that aren't canceled too. But the ones that are canceled are really are really cheap. They're just worth, they're not even worth the paper they're printed on. But for me, they have a... Um, well, they have a, a sentimental value because I, I like the um, – they have a meaning because of the business I'm in. And also, they're, uh, they're quite uh, – the art on them is just absolutely beautiful. And so I framed a few of them, stuck them in my office. I've got Studebaker and some uh, weird things like the Eurofund and Sunray Mid-Continental Oil Company. Uh, the cancel ones, again, they're worthless because they're no longer – uh, there, but you know, if you made a hobby out of that, which I've got enough hobbies, I think it'd be kind of fun. And if you could find and do the research, and you could find uncanceled ones, sometimes uh, a stock from like the 1900s might have gotten bought out six times, and it might actually still be worth something because it might be part of AT and T now or something. It might be worth like a thousand shares of AT and T or whatever. So you never know. I think if you dug hard enough and collected un uncanceled ones, I think that would probably be a fun hobby and something to do. I just have too many hobbies to begin with, uh, but I think it would be kind of cool. But, yeah, check out eBay for that, and then um, look online uh, and just type in stock certificates, and, and you can find them online. Okay. Don says, do you have Ford there or cool? <laughs> no, Don, I don't have Ford. <laughs> Scripology is a good source for old certificates. S C R I P O P H Scripophily. S boy, my eyes are really shot here. S C R I P O P H I L Y. Okay, Scripophily, good source for old stock certificates. Okay, all right, I digress a little bit, but uh, that's kind of fun stuff, though. Uh, old Wall Street adage: Stocks take the escalator up. And the elevator down. So the escalator up. I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but we got a little. It might take a second to catch up. And they take the elevator down. Now you got to really watch this one. It's going to be quick. Zoom. <laughs> you probably didn't see that, but the. Um, the window down. <laughs> That's funny. So the point is that stocks tend to sort of gradually go higher, like the escalator. I mean, there's some fits and starts here and there, but as a general statement, they tend to just kind of gradually rise in here. And this will look a little bit better in the recording than it does now. Uh, and that's an old Wall Street adage, and it's true. And the mentality changes quickly. And if you think about the usual suspects in there, let's say you do need money for your kid's education. Well, as long as the market's going higher and you don't need the money tomorrow, or let's say you're able to kind of budget the money and, and kind of save that money for a little later down the line, as long as the market's going higher and you're making more money on that money, then you're willing to take money out of your budget to take care of that child while that child's money continues to grow in the market. So that makes a lot of sense. That's pretty obvious. But the problem becomes when that child's educational fund starts to evaporate, what's going to happen? Well, you need at some point you've got to rush in and stop the bleeding, okay? And that could be any other reason you want, divorce or whatever. Let's say you've got your eye on a boat, a house, or whatever, and you want to pay cash for it. Well, at some point, 
you got to stop the bleeding, okay, or end up in a double wide or a single wide <laughs> or a P-Rogue, okay? So that's why stocks, there's a panic. Everybody tries to get out right away. The gradual up move is people buy and people hold on and people buy and they hold on. It's not such a panic on the upside, except in 2000, early 2000, late 1999, but that's that's another story altogether. So, in general, stocks do take the elevator up and the escalator down. Now, the reason I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here is that you can have some really deep retraces when it comes to the short side. And what happens, or the downside, I should say, um, what happens is, come on, well, I can't get a um, pen to work. Let's see. Here we go. What happens is, like I said, stocks take the the elevator down. So stocks tend to drop really quick and the escalator back up. But after a big drop like this, what will happen is you'll have the bottom fishers come in. You'll have shorts begin to cover. And the shorts are a little bit better traders than the longs, okay, As, at least when it comes to taking profits. They're, they're, they're worse traders on the upside because they, they just short the market to be shorting it. But when the market starts tanking and they're shorting, they tend to cover quickly because they don't want to be the last one to cover. So everyone tends to rush in, and that's why you have these sharp retrace rallies. So just know that on the downside, you can have a pretty serious retrace rally. Now, if you're in a market that's been dropping for a couple of years, okay, like 2009, it kind of flattens out, or even spikes lower, all of a sudden comes straight back up, then you might have a bottom. But when we get to the charts in a few minutes, all right, James, I'll, I'll cover those stocks you asked for in a few minutes. Um, so um, I'll get them covered for you. I'll get the recording out tonight. The recording will be tonight's um, um, service. So anyway, so if you get this a good serious rally off a of major, major low, then it could be the market turning. But the market right now kind of looks like this. It kind of rolled over a little bit. And this is kind of what we're seeing so far, okay? And that's a lot different than this, okay, where the market's been in a downtrend for a long, long time. So we're still at really high levels. Um, as I preach and as we're going to see here in a few minutes with the transitional setups, you want to look for the transitional setups after major highs or major, major lows. You don't want to look for them in between. Let me show you that real quick and then I'll talk about it even more when we get to the charts okay um, let's say market runs up to here comes back in okay and then let's say market runs down to here well you want to look for transitional setups up here and down here you're not you're not so much focused on a transitional setup or a new emerging trend a trend reversal however you want to look at it in the middle of of the major longer term trend. You want to look for it at the edges or the fringes, okay? And I'll flesh that out in a few in a little bit more uh, detail when we get to it. But you will have the point I'm trying to make is you will have these deep retraces and you don't want to be looking for you don't want to be looking for some sort of buying opportunity down here just because the market's low. Or if you see it begin to rally a little bit, you don't want to hop back in. Once a market begins to sell off from major, major highs like this, and people are like, okay, well, what would it take to get you bullish? Well, for me, I'd like to see brand new highs in here, and then maybe I can reevaluate the situation and think about what I want to do. Right now, what I'm seeing empirically is that most stocks appear to be in downtrends. And I could do a quick flip through in a few minutes uh, on the database, and you'll see that most stocks are in downtrend. So every day I'm looking at a couple thousand stocks, and I'm doing this what I call empirical research or observational research. I guess you could call it observational finance, okay, or observational analysis. And what I'm seeing is that many, 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 many stocks are in downtrends. I also quantified it a little bit. And I saw that about 70% of the, or 65 to 70%, I forget the exact numbers, I have them here, uh, of the Morningstar industry groups are in 
downtrends um, as evidenced by the downtrend proper order of the bowtie moving average, meaning that the the 10 is less than the 20 and the 20 is less than the 30. The 20, 30 EMAs and then the the 10 is a simple moving average. I'm doing a little trying to multi-process my apologies. Um, yeah, I've got 86 percent. I need to check this figure. That's, that's amazing. Wow. I didn't realize it was that high. I should have wrote that. Should have written that in the column this morning. Uh, Eighty-six percent of the morning store industry groups are in downtrend proper order. If all you ever did was pay attention to the the proper order of the bow ties, meaning that the ten's greater than twenty and the twenty's greater than thirty for uptrends, and you stayed long as long as that was the case. And just the opposite for downtrends, you stayed short as long as that was the case. You'd have some whipsaws here and there. You'd have some losses here and there. But as a general statement, and, and that's where you get in trouble in the markets, I know. But as a general statement, you would be on the right side of the market. Okay? So empirically, I'm looking at a lot of charts. And it's like, oh, looks like they're going down. And then I run some statistics, and I know statistics are worthless. 75.3% of all people know that. But I run some statistics and run some scans, and I see that in the S&Ps, four out of five stocks are in downtrends, okay, defined by those aforementioned moving averages. And I look at the Morningstar industry groups, and I see that nearly 90% of those are in downtrends too. So what does that tell me? Well, it tells me that the market might be in a downtrend even though the P's did a bit of a one of these numbers, okay? But even if it does one of these deep retraces, that does not mean that the market is fine, okay? You have to look within, and you have to dig within and see. Yeah, those short-covering rallies suck, okay? But you have to get out of the way. You have to honor your stops, and that's why we take profits along the way. We had one recently hit the initial profit target, Turn around and went back up, scratched out for pretty much a scratch. By the time you factor in all your costs and all, it was a scratch. Yeah, it's better than poke the eye. It happened so fast that if you annual annualize that move, it was still a pretty good move. One percent on the overall portfolio over a short period of time. Okay. All right, dead money report brought to you by again another one of my uh, <laughs> fetishes here. My domains trendfollowingmoron.com okay today's dead money report is sketchers once again we're going to talk about sketchers now we've been i've been using this as the beat the dead horse example for a while on don't micromanage stay with the course stay the course and hopefully i hate to use the word hope but hopefully it works out because otherwise i'm going to have a little egg on my face and i'm going to be wrong but i still think it has some pretty serious potential in it. Now, the don't confuse the issue with facts comes in with they came out with earnings that were about, Phil's in here. Phil, you in here about 100% better than what they thought they were going to have last year? Dave, why are you looking at earnings? Well, I'm looking at earnings because I get a little news through osmosis, and this morning that osmosis happened to be Phil from the U.K., pointing out the fact that the stock was trading lower in spite of 100% increase in earnings and as you can see nice little slide there now we've been in this one for a little while and we've gone from profitability to unprofitability and now we're back to profitability so what okay so what today's swing makes a big difference in the portfolio because if you make this number negative and you go to a positive here that makes quite a big difference so that's good to know by the way this is the model portfolio from my trading service. So you're probably saying, hey, Dave, we're going to learn more about dead money. We'll get the flash drive for the first half of the year. And like I said last week, I'll give you every show that we've done since the first half of the year if you get those flash drives, which gives you about an extra 10 shows or so. All right, let's talk about emerging trend patterns off of all time or major highs. Remember that the most amount of people are on the wrong side of the market. 
Okay, Robert says, I know it's down today and good call. What's so special about this chart? SKX makes you think the stock's in such trouble. Special, well, especially over other shorted candidates. Well, I wouldn't rush out and short it today, Robert, but as you know, if you're, you're in the service, so you know when I recommended this stock, the reason I liked it was it made all-time highs. And this is what I'm getting ready to talk about, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it again. Anyone who's ever owned a stock here up until the last little dude that bought like the last little tick is happy. But what happens when it begins to drop and drop and drop and drop and drop and drop and gap down, okay? Well, everyone from here back becomes unhappy, okay? And if you back this chart way out, it looks like this longer term, okay? So this could just be the tip of the iceberg as far as how far I think the stock has to go. So I liked it a couple of weeks ago, and I still think it's in trouble. Now, I'm in for a penny, in for a pound. If I get stopped out, I get stopped out. So what? Won't be the first time, won't be the last. It's one of the few things I can guarantee. But it makes for a wonderful example because for some reason, I get an email once a day on this stock. Dave, oh, they got earnings. What do we do? Dave, uh, it's, it's negative, and it was positive. What do we do? Dave, it's the market's rallying. What do we do? It's like nothing. Follow your plan. You'll make yourself crazy. <laughs> you drive yourself crazy, which is some, for some of us is a short trip. For me, it would be a short trip. Uh, but you'll drive yourself crazy trying to factor in and figure out all that stuff. This is all you have to do. Got a little stop in there, okay? A little stop right in here somewhere. If the market does this, you get out, okay? If the market does this, you take partial profits, and you trail that stop down. It's that easy, okay? Well, I hate to use the word easy when it comes to trading, but it's never easy. But it's not nearly as difficult as most people try to make it, okay? Now, you don't, you follow your plan. I mean, just a couple days ago, this thing was up uh, big, and that made all the difference in the world in portfolio, and now it slipped back into the minus column. I think it still has potential. So we're not going to get rid of it just yet. We're going to wait until what? The sob gets hit, okay? Baba exceeds IPO first five days. Hi, your thoughts. Uh, we'll talk about it when we get to the stocks, Daniel. Okay. Now, emerging trends, as I alluded to a second ago, when you have an emerging trend or a trend transitional pattern off of all-time highs, the most amount of people are on the wrong side of the market. And pressure is put on those people. Now, sometimes you're still a pioneer, okay? And like the American pioneers, you either get the gold or you're going to get the arrows. The chance of the arrows makes it all worthwhile. And the reason is because... And to those international guests we have today, it's just the, the gold of the arrow saying is basically saying that American pioneers, some of them struck it rich, they got gold, some of them starved to death, and some of them got shot by Indians, okay? Uh, so they either, they either got rich or they died, or they died trying, I should say. So you're still a bit of an American pioneer, or like a pioneer, I should say, when it comes to a transitional setup, because sometimes... You just have a little bit of a, a blip and what turns out to be a longer-term trend. But at the time, it looks like a major rollover. But guess what? Every one of these signals, or I should say every major top, every, every major top, one cup of coffee next time, Dave. Uh, every, every major top, let me get my tongue unstuck from the roof of my mouth. Every major top will have an emerging trend or transitional trend pattern. But not every emerging trend or transitional transitional trend pattern will turn into a major top. Okay? But you still need to take them seriously. And I'm going to quote Greg yet again this week. So every signal is treated as if it will turn into the big one. And it might not. So if it doesn't, so what? He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Next week or maybe a week after that, or a week after that, we'll either get stopped out on sketches or we'll make some money. If we make some money, I'll say, you see, I told you to stick with it. And if we get stopped out, I'll be like, well, so what? It happens. Spell it with a silent SH, right? 
Anyway, there's a quote again from Greg, which we'd all signals is the major one. This is the um, this is the original trade in Skechers, and somebody said, well, "Why is Skechers so great?" Well, if I was just seeing this chart today, I'd be all over it. One, you got a big wide range bar down off of all time highs. Two, you got a gap down here. Okay. Three, you got a bow tie beginning to form. Uh, four, this is a pretty serious slide. Five, it pulls back a little bit. Okay. I forget what six is. Seven. It triggers and looks like it's getting ready to implode. Looks like it, it's going to run at least 45 before it pauses, which would be enough money for us to squeeze out or thereabouts uh, some partial profits. And then from there, if you back the chart way out, it looks like it's a, it, it could be a route further down. So that's why I liked it. But you can see, again, everybody's happy until now, and then they become sad. Okay, it's like the Kind of like a roller coaster or that, that uh, affirmation escalator. Click, 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 just working its way higher, right? And then it implodes. So that's the nature of the short side. Everybody kind of runs to the door at the same time. Here's the P's. Again, this is a little bit dated chart, but you can see we had the bow tie here. It's the second bow tie. The first bow tie really didn't trigger or trigger by much. It materialized. Market turned right around, went right back up. Now it looks like this could be the real deal. Of course, what's happened? It sold off hard. We got a little bit of a retrace rally. So what? Okay. We'll see what happens. And then again, this is just a, an, a historical example of what can happen when you have that second signal. This was the first signal here. It didn't really materialize. didn't really trigger, I think, if you waited for a full uh, bow tie to occur. And it came back up. It made a slightly new high here, all-time high in the euro. And then you had the bow tie down, and then it imploded from there. Again, not every signal will turn into mother of all tops, but every mother of all tops will have a signal. Now, we're getting ready to jump into charts. You guys can start asking about individual stocks uh, now, if you like. Uh, stores open, DaveLandry.com slash store, uh, 24 hours a day. Check it out if you get a chance. Um, still have volume one again. Uh, the flash drives, I'll give you the entire year up till now if you get those. So that will save you a little bit. Um, the stock selection webinar doesn't come with the IPO webinar anymore. Uh, so, okay, that's special limited on 922. Gotcha. All right, so uh, right now, stock selection webinar does come at one year of the trading service, okay, which is a 1460 value. So you get about half off on that uh, if you if you factor in the cost of the trading service so that's I'm still running that special but the IPO uh, webinar is now a standalone product on that okay um, and check out my YouTube channel if you get a chance it's pretty cool if I say so myself uh, I built a studio in my office I'm still working a few kinks out and there's a couple things I want to do um, but at some point I got to quit tinker with it and just make some videos and I've got some pretty cool um, some pretty cool stuff that I'm working on, and I think it's going to make. I, I got to temper the G whiz factor with the with the content, but uh, I've got some pretty good content, and the G whiz factor I think is going to help me deliver it. I'm pretty excited about it. So keep an eye on the YouTube channel. I did my first video there on setting up your trading, um, your computers for trading. Use a little green screen, little chroma key on that. Sounds not a thousand percent, but I've since bought a sound recorder to remedy that problem. So stay tuned on that and check it out if you get a chance. Okay. All right. We've got a few questions stacking up before we hop into the uh, charts. Okay. All right. We'll get to that. Yeah, John, I agree with you on that. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get, we'll get to that. Uh, would you consider stocks holding above their 20 MA with MAs in proper order? Potential long candidates, is the as they set up um, I have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and you have to remember that the the problem we're up against now is we're having some stocks go back up at high levels and like I said earlier if something's dropping like this it drops for a few years it comes down here it begins to set up then I give that a big check mark that's that's great okay that's a transitional pattern but if something's dropping like this and all of a sudden stops and starts going back up, 
this will not be a buy signal based on the methodology. It can only be a buy signal if it makes it back to new highs and then begins to pull back, okay? Um, you're not going to catch every zig and zag with the methodology, but longer term, you'll do just fine, okay? And I think that's part of a methodology or any methodology. Early in my trading, I tried to catch every move that I could. I wanted to write a methodology to catch every move. I wanted to play choppy markets. I wanted to play trending markets. I wanted to play reversing markets. I wanted to play reversals. And luckily, luckily, very luckily, I, I hooked up with some people that basically kind of told me in so many words. I was trying to chase moon tail. And at the time, I didn't want to hear it because I was going to find that holy grail and prove them wrong. But the reality is they were right. You got to find something and stick to it. And no, it's not perfect. And no, you're not going to catch every move. Okay. Sometimes people show me a big move in the market. And I'm like, well, you know, so what? I, I could, I would not have caught that move with my methodology. And it's like you have to let some things go. And it's, it's that's part of your maturation, if that's a word, process as a trader is just let some things go. Okay. So we're, if the question is, about the moving average, it's above moving average, would you consider buying it? Uh, I'd have to, I'll know it when I see it. I have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But the only sector out there that I'm seeing setups in is biotechnology at this point, okay? Where you declare a short setup, if you get subsequent further retracement of the downtrend for the next day or two, do you move your entry point? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you do want to give the... Um, let me, uh, I'm going to draw on this chart just so I don't have to start from scratch. But um, the question is, if you have a short setup, let's say a short setup looks like this, okay, and your entry's here, you give it a little bit of wiggle room. Well, the stock, the next day goes to here, next day goes to here. You know, what do you do? Well, you do bump that entry up some. You want to give it a little wiggle room just in case it begins to sell off, kind of like we saw yesterday, it goes right back up. My theory is that, as I said, and I did an interview yesterday for Benzinga. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, you should be able to get it because I, I think I like my own uh, deal. If not, if you follow me on Twitter, you, you've got it too. But if not, just let me know. I'll send you the uh, the deal. And, and it wouldn't surprise me if we have a fake out of a fake out of a fake out, meaning that the market faked out by shooting higher, and then yesterday it looked like it was going to turn right back down, and then today it goes up, and then tomorrow we get the real deal, okay? Now, who knows, okay? One day at a time, but a lot of times the market will fake out quite a bit. Okay, what's the difference between the IPO course and the stock selection course? Thanks. The stock selection course is how to pick the best stocks, okay? It's 14 hours. It's it's the core methodology. It's what I do every day. It's how I pick the sketchers. It's how I picked the stocks that you see currently in the portfolio. If you go in and look at the stock selection webinar, or I should say course page, you'll see a list of stocks that I picked on that particular day, and I walk you through the entire process. The stock, the, the IPO course is how to pick and trade IPOs. It pertains specifically to IPOs, and there are patterns that are specific to IPOs. It's slightly outside of the core methodology, but there's a lot of dovetailing and overlapping between the two, between as far as the core methodology is concerned. But the IPO course has specific patterns that aren't exactly the same patterns that we're trading in the core methodology. Okay. But thanks, uh, thanks for asking that, uh, Daniel. Gives me a chance to put out a free plug. <laughs> Thank you, man. All right, uh, let's hop into the charts, and we'll um, we'll cover all those questions you're asking about. Good, good stuff stacking up. Fantastic. We have a very attentive crowd today. Good, glad you're here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Dr. Tony, if you're here, go back to saving lives. <laughs> you got to read my column. I say, if you're not busy saving lives, um, let's take a look at a couple things here. First of all, let's take a look at what's going on with the peas. And you can see that we're kind of headed up again today. I wouldn't get too excited about this. Again, the market would pretty much have to make new highs 
for me to get excited. You can have some really deep tra retraces, especially on the short side, as I just said a minute ago. And as I said a second ago, it wouldn't surprise me. We had the, the big up day, the water's fine, and then we had the fake out yesterday like it's going back down, and then this is like another fake out. Um, as I often say, and I quote Rasky and others by saying uh, it's an old Wall Street adage, but that's where I got it from is Rasky, is that the market will often do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most people. And the corollary of that is that a market will also will often do the obvious in the most unobvious manner. If it's going to sell off and it looks like it's going to tank, it's going to have a pretty serious rally first. Show the article. Um, I forget which which um, the article from today. Just go to my website for today's article. Is there another article you're looking for? If you need bow ties, I have a um, I have a YouTube on bow ties, and if you go to today's column, I have a link to it. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's the P's. So far, just retracing higher. I wouldn't get too excited just yet. Okay, when in doubt, take the chart out. It, you can see it's still got that reverse check mark look to it. Um, I don't want to use the word gatekeeper, but maybe like on a two day chart or a three day chart. A gatekeeper is when you have a sharp sell off and a sharp retrace back up, and then the market finally dies. Okay, and if you think about the, 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 the thinking behind that, is you have that one last gasp up to new highs and then the market dies or near new highs. It stalls out, stores, stalls short of them. Uh, tomorrow, potentially wonderful opportunity in playing an opening gap reversal. So keep an eye out for that. Okay. It's not your bread it's not a bread and butter trade, but it's better than poke in the eye. NASDAQ got a little follow through today. Uh, let's not start kissing each other just yet again for me to get excited. Market would have to make new highs. I don't want to play for for this much, okay? I don't want to play for that much. It's like uh, you think, okay, well, human nature is saying, if I could draw this line in here, I have to draw kind of askew. I don't want to play for that much or whatever it is from 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 where we are now to new highs. That that doesn't excite me, okay? That little bit. I'm making a little bit uh, sign with my fingers okay with my thumb my forefinger so what if I give up that part of the move I don't care okay if the market goes on and starts making new highs it's a trend follower then I gotta pick myself up dust myself off and start all over again maybe those shorts will stop out of profits along the way and I can go back to being long fine with me I would much rather be long and stay long and just enjoy the ride for the rest of my life. If I never had to put on another short, again, that would be totally fine with me. But I play the short side for two reasons, okay? One, to make money, obviously. That's the obvious reason, okay? But the problem is it is a pain in the butt. You do have big retrace rallies, and sometimes you question whether or not it's even worth playing. Well, the second reason, which is – I'm not going to say more important than making money because nothing's more important than making money, right, in this business. When you just, as far as business is concerned, obviously, there's more important things in life. Well, maybe not. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> but the second reason is it helps me to see both sides of the market. So if I'm long and feeling good and making a lot of money on longs, and all of a sudden I start seeing bow ties set up to the short side or first thrusts or gatekeepers or whatever the case may be, reversal gap strategy, any of my other strategies, and start seeing them set up on the downside, then it's like, hey, dummy, the market might be rolling over. Now, I'm not going to rush out and sell all my longs, but I'm certainly going to pay attention to those stops, okay, and honor those stops. And I'm also going to be, eh, I might pull my horns in a little bit. I'm going to be a little bit more selective before I rush out and I buy any more stocks. So that's the beautiful thing about playing the short side, which is probably more important than the fact that you can make money on the short side. Now, the short side, again, it's tough. You know, somebody once told me, because I was talking about the retrace rallies, they said, well, I exit all of my positions at the first sign of adversity. Well, what does that mean? It's like you would never – it seems like all shorts go against you at some point. So you would you would already been out of Skechers, um, which – May or may not work out, but if it works out big, you already would have gotten out because it's already going against you. So I, I don't know how you could do that. 
Uh, I think there's some things that are in theory and some things that are in practice. And as you'll find out quickly in markets, sometimes uh, those two things aren't the same. Uh, insurance, sharp slide, a bit of a retrace in here. I think it's still in trouble. Pick your sectors. In fact, this is kind of like a high-level witch hat. Uh, this is what hospitals you can see. looks like they're still in quite a bit of trouble. E for share, shares outside of the United States. What's going on there? Well, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out they're headed lower, okay? So that's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, EFA, I think, stands for Europe and for Europe, Far East, and Asia. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I'm not sure. But it's stuff outside the U.S., and it doesn't include Canada. It does not include Canada either. Uh, chemical sharp retrace. Which way do they look like they're headed? Well, it's look like they're headed lower in here. Uh, transport sharp retrace. Look like they're in trouble to me, though. Okay. Uh, energies. Well, that's obviously still in trouble and pulling back a little bit. Metals and mining. Now, metals, metals and mining have been decimated forever. They're down here scraping lows. So if you want to short something, I wouldn't rush out and short the metals and mining. I'd much rather short something at a higher level, like some of those aforementioned sectors, as opposed to metal and mining. Gold, scraping bottom here. I wouldn't rush out and buy it. Notice it's banging out new lows again today. This is why you don't rush out and buy it, because it's still in a downtrend. It's taking out its lows. But eventually it might bottom out here, and that might be one sector that I could become interested in. Silver also broke down, too. Uh, for the most part, though, most of these sectors at these high levels in here have only retraced, have only retraced and looked poised to make a new leg lower. It's kind of interesting that even the foods kind of look like they're in trouble in here. And if you know markets, uh, you know that there's a flight to safety when the market begins to tank because people still have to eat in a bear market, right? Okay, well, when you see foods looking a little iffy in here, not that you want to rush out and short them, but that could be a sign that the market could still be in trouble. S&P potential H&S, well, let's take a look at that. Um, no, because a head and shoulders, well, I kind of hear you. I mean, it still looks like it's topping in here. Um, I just don't see it, but it doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, maybe it's kind of like one with multiple tops, okay? Uh, I don't trade a head and shoulders or a double top or anything else in and of itself, anything else when it comes to classical technical analysis in and of itself. But I will trade something that uh, – I will trade a bow tie that comes after a head and shoulder like we just had in the overall market. So once you get that set up, that's your signal. That's your trigger your um, head and shoulders or your multiple tops or whatever you want to call it is kind of like your, your framework, your bigger picture framework. But you don't want to rush in and execute until you actually have a setup and a trigger. And you'll find that gatekeepers and bow ties and first thrusts and all these other wonderful patterns, if I say so myself, that I've discovered work really well within the context of bigger picture technical analysis. But you'll get into a lot of trouble if you try to trade bigger picture technical analysis in and of itself. You're much better off waiting for the setup, the trigger, and the signal. Okay? Or the signal, the trigger, and the setup. Setup, the trigger, signal. Setup, and the trigger. How's that? All right. John says cheers. All right. Cheers, John. Frenchy says okay. Okay, Frenchy. Dave, with XLU, do you look at previous support to make a guess as to how in trouble something is, i.e., potential consolidation versus elevator down? Looks like support at 75. Well, you always want to look at support, okay? Uh, now, here's the thing, too. Now, this is an ETF, so it's a little bit um, skewed. But lately, I've been seeing a plethora of sales shorts. And those that have already had a 50% haircut, I haven't been showing to my peeps in the service because I think they've gone down at least enough for now. Or more accurately, I think that stocks that are higher levels still have the potential to go down further. Now, here's a here's an ETF. So this move is pretty significant here, even though it's only 20%. That's a pretty significant move for an ETF. So this has already made its major move down as far as I'm concerned. But, yeah, it could have another leg in it. Now, the point is, uh, does it have support? 
yeah, it could find a little support. You've got a lot of trading back here. So it could it could be running into a support zone. So I'm much much more interested in it up here than I am in it down here. And yes, I do factor those things in when I'm looking at a short to see if there's any visible support. Let's take a look at XKX and you can see you got a little bit of support here, but not much. So it looks like it's up at fifty something dollars a share. Looks like it could easily trade down to thirty to forty or maybe even twenty dollars a share in here without much support. In it. Whereas that other guy, you can see it's got a lot of trading down below the market. So, yeah, always look for your support under the market. I just beat a guy up. Um, I think he just left. I just beat James up because James emailed me. He goes, hey, Dave, how's this for a short? I'm like, looks fantastic. But you've got about a year's worth of trading sitting right below the market. Okay, and that's, you know, so you asked about the stock selection webinar a minute ago. That's the kind of things we talk about in the stock selection webinar. A lot of the things that sort of come out naturally each week of like why I like or why I do not like a stock. So if it's got a big mountain of support right below the market where well, you don't want to short it because that's possibly all you can get. You're welcome, Steve. Steve says, great job. Would you trade bow ties also on Forex and 4H charts? Yeah, uh, Daniel, we cover this uh, quite often. Let me just, I don't want to bore anybody in here too much, but let me just show you something. Okay. Um, and that's another thing, you know, getting back to the, not the soft sell, the webinar, the stock selection course. But we spent about an hour talking about efficiency and inefficiency. And let me just give you that speech in a nutshell. Uh, something like Forex is not going to be discovered overnight. It's a very efficient market. You've got hedgers. you got people who are buying and selling things across the borders that have to hedge their uh, currency bets. You've got speculators. You've got one lotters. You've got all kinds of people. And they tend to fight it. They tend to cancel each other out and fight it out. But every now and then, you can have major, major moves in commodities or Forex or futures or, or, or some of these more efficient markets. And for instance, Efficiency versus inefficiency. You take a look at spiders, it's got an HP of like 10. And then you take a look at like a little biotech company that goes up 500% over a short period of time. It might have an HV of 200 or 150, whatever. So you can see there's a much, one market is more efficient than the other. So Forex is one of those more efficient markets because there's trillions of dollars being traded. If you are going to trade Forex, then you want to come in here right after these all-time highs, and then if it starts making like a multi-year low or ideally an all-time low, that's where you want to come in and look to buy. Uh, leave the middle of the market alone when it comes to efficient markets, okay? Let's say you want to be a commodity trader and all you want to do is trade commodities. Well, let those commodities hit life of contract. I should say life of contract, uh, but um, multi-year lows and then look to buy them as they're coming off their lows. But making some sort don't buy them because they're low, but buy them because they're making some sort of transitional pattern off of their lows, okay? What's a 4H chart? Uh, also on 4X, what's a 4H, what do you mean by a 4H chart? I don't know what that is. GLD, uh, GLD time frames. Oh, four hour, oh, four hour chart. Um, yeah, I mean, if you are gonna trade, okay, here's the thing. If you are gonna be a, let's take a look at like spiders. If you are gonna trade intraday, then consider yourself an intraday position trader. Let's take a look at a bow tie in the spiders, for instance. Okay. Now, this is what you do. Then look for like a bow tie. Here you got a bow tie off of all time highs on an hourly chart, and look what the market did. Okay. Now, not that you would have held overnight through all those moves lower. That was a tremendous move lower, but you kind of get the idea. You want to try to hold on as long as you can intraday when you're trading these intraday patterns okay so yeah you could use it on a four hour chart or a one hour chart or whatever you want or a five minute chart uh, patterns are fractal okay so let's say you wanted to short the peas okay well look they're making a pretty good uh, the spiders they made you know and this is a hindsight obviously but made a pretty good bow tie here they made a first thrust here. here's your first thrust made a bow tie and then they made a pretty nice little leg lower okay so now, if anything, since they ran up so much, maybe look to take the bow tie down on a five-minute chart. Again, not my cup of tea, but if you want to do it, fine. Or look at this opening gap reversal. That's a gift right there. Okay, we had a little opening gap reversal. What we had what yesterday was really nice. Nice little uh, gift once again in the market. So if you are going to intraday trade, 
then intraday position traded and look for these major setups in the overall market. Maybe look at a daily time frame and then drill down to that intraday time frame. So, yeah, Daniel, uh, absolutely. Patterns are fractal. Just be careful in the more efficient markets like indices, like the spiders, of course, and in the forex. GLD is an untied bow tie. Let's see what he means by that. GLD. Uh, GLD, untied bow tie. Well, I just hadn't tied yet. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the problem with gold. It, it just takes the, – the, the bottom here appears to be a process and not an event. So we're about two years or a year and a half into the bottom in gold. It hasn't quite bottomed out yet. Okay. So, yeah, leave it alone. Uh, but I wouldn't say it untied because it hadn't it hadn't tied yet. <laughs> Depends on how you want to look at that. Okay, let's uh, B A B A. Um, Baba exceeds first day's trading. Uh, what are you, your thoughts? Uh, I would not consider Baba unless it got above the Daniel. Do you have the IPO course? Go in and watch it. And we talked about what to do with these higher price ones. And just to just to answer the question, I would not consider this stock unless it took out the high of its first day's trade before getting started. But yeah, to my surprise, and this is what this is, you know, market do whatever it wants. I thought this was going to be the biggest stinker in history. And so far, I mean, I was right for quite a while in here. Not that I traded it uh, because you can't short an IPO when they just come out the gate. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of bottoming out. It looks like it's on its way higher. I would I would touch with a 10 foot pole. But maybe if it if it took out that um, that high, I would think about it. SH for those who can't short, or any tips for those who can't short. Okay, inverse ETFs are a bad way to go when it comes to shorting. The problem with an inverse ETF is they track day over day change. So if a market goes down ten percent. Your account, let's say, goes up 10%. So far, so good. Well, if the market goes back up 10%, that ETF tracked on a day-to-day -day basis should go down 10%. And the reality is once you, if you look at the drawdown chart, if you lose 10% of your account, then it takes 11.1% to make it back to break even. So if you add in, if you do the math on these inverse ETFs, you're going to have a horrible tracking error over time. Let me see if I can find a, a, a better, I'm kind of getting twisted up in here. But I could explain it, maybe I can give you a better example. Um Just know this, because it tracks a day-over-day -day change, it's the old lose 10%, need to make back 11%. And if it's, if it's leveraged, it's even worse because, you, you let's say it goes down 10% and you make 20% on your account, and then let's say it goes up 20% and then you lose 20% on your account, uh, that's a bigger number. Let's see if we could do this. Let's say you make $1,000. Let's say you have $1,000. And it goes down 10%, so you get two times that amount. So 1,000, I'm going to get all tripped up, 1.2. It's $1,200. So then you have $1,200. Okay, now say that the next day it goes down 10%, so you lose, or it goes up 10%, so you lose 20% of your account. So 1,200 times 20% equals 960, okay? So if it's leveraged, you can see what happens. It let's say you have a 10% plus and then a 10% minus. Okay, well the market is here, here, here. Market's exactly the same, but you see how your account has lost money because it went up two times this. That's 20% move is 1,200, and then it lost 10%. It went down two times that. Based on your account, that puts you below where you started. Now, that's a bit of an extreme uh, example. But as a general statement, they tend to just go down, okay? So if you're trying to trade something like SH, what's going to happen is it's just going to, in general, go down. Now, the market in general has gone up, but you, you get the idea. These things, for the most part, just go down, 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 down. You think, oh, it's cheap down here. I'll buy it. 
no, don't do that because they'll reverse split it is what they'll do. And, and it just it just perpetually they just perpetually go down. Now if you could short these things, short them. Short the shorts. <laughs> but they're hard to borrow because I'm not the first person that's figured that out, okay? Um, and then you could you could look at some of these things on a micro level and see that well the, the market had a big sell off, and then you would actually even if you caught like this move here within a day or two you'd be that those gains would have evaporated in them. So you got to be really careful. Now if the market sells off and keeps selling off, then these things could actually work. But it's it, like a market in 2008, 2009, early 2009, they could work. But for the most part, tracking error is absolutely abysmal. So. Um, I would avoid the adverse ETFs. So what do you do? Well, you can buy puts, okay? Now, that opens up a can of worms, but at least um, you can still position by buying puts. And you can buy in-the-money puts to get your deltas just right. And if you don't know about what I'm saying, just get educated. Um, by the way, my, my first book, way back in 2000, I did write about using options as a substitution for stock. If you email me, I'll send you that chapter. But the book's only 19 bucks, so just buy the book. How's that? <laughs> uh, Don's here. Can anyone guess what he wants to know about? He wants to know about F. Well, F is in a downtrend. And if you guys remember, let's go back a few Don weeks, and what do we have with F? Well, you had... You did have your bow ties cross over here. It's kind of sloppy. It's not a stock I would trade just because it's sloppy in its trading. But you can see that it's pulled back, sold off. Now it's pulled back again. Uh, if anything, if I had to trade it, I would say it looks like it's poised to make a new leg lower. I would not trade it because it's a big, thick stock, and it tends to just bounce around a lot. Now, it doesn't mean if it makes the mother of all setups, then absolutely I'll go after it. Oh, you have my first book, John? Thank you. Yeah, go in there. Read the chapter on puts. If you can't find it, I'll send it to you. TWTR, Twitter. Um, I don't see anything to really get excited about here. You've got bad memories still with this stock way back here. Uh, if anything, it does look like it's kind of trying to roll back over. Um, I would much prefer find a stock at higher levels that's in the early phase of rolling over than something like Twitter down here. Yeah, John, that set up again. That was a short. I, I have a bad habit on the short side, or a good habit, depends on how you want to look at it, of being ripe but early. And I think I, I, we had, uh, this is one of the shorts that didn't work out. Uh, it triggered, looked like it was a mother of all tops, and it ran right back up and made that one final top in here. Um, I don't like the gap right here that much, though, so I would pass. But as far as a stock that still looks like it's in trouble, as a general statement, I think it still looks like it is in trouble. Okay. INVN, long yet? Oops. Um, no. Why would you be long that? Um, now I wouldn't rush out and short it, but if you if you said, Dave, you want to buy this stock, or you want to sell it, I'd say, well, I want to short it because it looks like it's headed lower to me. But it is a little wide and loose, so I would probably avoid, uh, or I can tell you right now, I would avoid it. Okay, Andre wants to know about you, you, you. Enough about you. Let's talk about, enough about me, let's talk about you. What do you think about me? One, two, three, four. Um, it's kind of scraping bottom in here. I don't think I'd do anything with it. It's super thin, too. Uh, I would allow it to continue to scrape bottom. The problem is it's going to have a lot of overhead supply and resistance with it. U, 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 three U's, not four. Oh, okay. Three U's. All right. Uh, universal security instruments. Uh, really thin there. I know you like those little thin ones, Andre. Um, Maybe on a pullback, maybe on a pullback, uh, but way, way, super, super, super thin. Be careful with that, okay? You got what I need, A-C-H-N. Uh, I would wait. See, this is a case where it's in the middle of the road, right, okay? Uh, so something like this, again, the methodology is not perfect. You might get a bow tie up in here, but I wouldn't take the bow tie up 
because it's not coming off of um, major lows. You'd have to wait for that to make new highs and pull back, and then let's reevaluate it when it does. RCL is going to be a sell, probably so, probably so. Or I saw this one a couple days ago. Um, I don't like the gap in here. I think it's in trouble, though. I know what you're doing, Phil. you probably got a 50-day moving average in there somewhere. Um, if we have time, Phil, send me a list of my recent stock picks uh, from my Landry list and how they all retraced up to the 50. This is one of them. Um, yeah, I think it's in trouble, but um, I'm not really crazy about the gap in here. Zoma. Oh, I do have some write-ins I can get to, too. Yeah, uh, Don, uh, it actually looks like it's bottoming out in here. Let's um, let's clean this chart up a little bit. Well, it's not all-time lows, but it is multi-year lows. I mean, maybe I'm just trying to throw Don a bone because we just pick on Don all the time. Uh, let it bow tie up before getting too excited, then let's reevaluate it. But no, it's too early now. I mean, draw your sideways arrow here, and you can see that it's it hasn't done anything in months. Um, got a few write-ins. Let's uh, let's do these real quick. Simo. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This looks like it's pulled back a little bit. Well, you got this one big wide range bar here. It's a little on the choppy side, but it's in trouble. Okay, so I can't argue with that one. Um, I think we could probably find better SLXP. Um, the only issue I have with some of these drugs and all in here is that you got to be, I don't want to say you got to be careful, but the problem is that in some cases there's still kind of an exciting stock, whereas if you look at some of the ones we're going after, like let's take a look at sketches because that's one I can mention because it already triggered. Um, what do they do? They make shoes, okay, and so what? They make shoes. So does Nike. So does Adidas. So does um, New Balance and um, everybody else. I gotta wear like New Balance shoes because I got big wide feet. My kids say it look like Papa shoes, but I don't care anymore. <laughs> anyway, they're not splitting the atom. They're making friggin' shoes, okay. But some of these drug stocks at all, I would prefer to go after more thick ones, okay. Uh, just because you don't want some little drug to have some cure for Ebola or, or something and uh, have the stock go straight up because it's such a such a small company. But Dave, aren't you confusing the issue with facts? Well, no, not necessarily. I'm just talking about stocks I prefer or the short side. I'd, I'd much rather shorter Skechers than a hot little biotech that's beginning to roll over just because it's going to be a lot more dangerous with that biotech than it would be the Skechers. I'd rather buy the biotech and short the Skechers. Um, Jillian, no, I'd leave this one alone because it's retraced all the way back up to its old highs. I get asked all the time, Dave, when's a retrace no longer retrace? Well, when it starts making new highs again, it's no longer a retrace. So let's take Jillian off the list. ZLTQ. ZLTQ. Um, I would find out what they do. The only problem is, again, it could be some sort of excitement uh, with the stock, it's a little bit, not super thin, but kind of thin on the short side for uh, to trade in the short side. You know, it's it's over half a million, but you want some pretty good volume on the short side if you're going to be trading. I don't like this big gap back here. I don't like all this trading back here. So even if it does trigger, it's going to run into this fluff here and could find some support. So I would take that off the list too. So um, out of those four, James, I really don't uh, see much to get too excited about. Um, in here, GS. Yeah, now see GS. Now, okay, I'd much rather short something like GS than something like a biotech. Now it is choppy back here, and it looks like it finds support within about ten points or whatever. But if all I had was this part of the chart, where you got a minor double top, you got an all-time high or at least a multi-year high. Yeah, all-time high, I think. Uh, pulling back, I'd say, yeah, go for it. But you do have a lot of support, a lot of trading in here. But this is where efficiency, this is a twist with efficiency. You're almost better off shorting a more efficient stock than shorting an inefficient stock, okay? ACHN, that sounds like a biotech, ACHN. It is. Yeah, again, you want to wait for new highs on that one. I think we covered that one. NXPI for Mr. Phil. 
in XPI. Yeah, yeah, that looks like a stock that's in a lot of trouble. This was on the Landry list um, recently. It does have some uh, a lot of trading in here, but if it begins to sell off, it's going to soon be below this. Um, it looks like it's triggering today. Uh, yeah, I'll give you a high five on that one. Uh, kind of a deep retrace, but that's kind of cool. Um, kind of a little bit of an unorthodox pattern. But, yeah, good eye on that, uh, Phil. Pan W for Miss Heather. Hello, Heather. Good to see you. Appreciate you stopping by. Uh, well, it's making new highs, so it's got to it's got to pull back before I would want to do anything with that. Okay, getting a little winky wink from Heather. Don't tell my wife. A F S I. Um, yeah, it's breaking out to new highs, uh, maybe on a pullback. Okay, let's see what happens with this one. Uh, let's not forget that so far the overall market's still a little iffy, so let's not get too excited just yet on the. Um, on the long side, but if we see something something we really, really, really like, then by all means we'll go after it. Bitta as a short. Bitta. Ah, uh, it's not jumping out at me, but let's uh, let's kind of look at it a little bit more in here. It has been in a bit of a slide. It has pulled back a bit of a slide. Haha. <laughs> uh, it has pulled back a bitta, but it's not jumping out at me. Um, I can't really argue with it, though. It, it has a pretty good slide. It's pulled back a little bit. Yeah, I think it looks like it's trying to head lower. Uh, but it seems to me you might be able to find something a little bit better out there. AKRX. AKRX. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good-looking stock, Heather, uh, except that we're going to need a pullback in here, okay, to get long. And this one, I don't know, this one kind of looks like it's kind of one of these box stocks. And, and again, the methodology doesn't work for every stock in the whole world. Um, but with these box stocks, sometimes they make a box, make a new box, and they keep making boxes and hard to get on. Um, but I think this would trigger like years ago at a pretty low level. But yeah, uh, maybe wait for follow through and a pullback on that one. Blue. B-L-U-E. No, no, no. We might have to whip out Nicholas on this one. Uh, no, it's just going sideways, okay? It would have to break out and make new highs before we get excited. It's kind of all over the place, too. Uh, I hear you, though. Today's got a nice little move, but let's, let, let's see if it can break out to new highs before getting too excited, okay? You're welcome, Heather. AAC for when? Um, yeah, this is a this is a hospital um, making new highs. Let's see if it can continue to make new highs, and then on a pullback. Uh, this was actually mentioned, I'm pretty sure, in the IPO webinar as a buy at t right around 20, or maybe not because it was at above 20. But uh, yeah, wait for a pullback on that one. Rocks. What if you get rocks and then you traded sand? What would happen? Anyone? <laughs> uh, it's making new highs, but yeah, wait for a pullback on that one. Long or short for all three? Oh, okay. Uh, long, but on a pullback. AFSI. AAC, did we took cover that one? Oops. Yeah, we covered that one. Uh, A T R A. Um, yeah, this is kind of interesting in here. It's um, it's thin, so you got to be real careful. But it does it does qualify as a buy based on the IPO course. So yeah, absolutely. Um, one, two, three, four. Yep. Yep. Um, I can't give you the parameters on that, but, um, absolutely. Kate, be careful though, very short. No, I mean, if anything, it looks like a short in here, as you can see, pretty serious downtrend. Um, it, you know, you had this really crazy day in here. I don't know what happened there. When you see such a crazy day like that, usually I want to avoid them. CMG, that's what, Chipotle? 
CMG. Yeah, it's kind of Chipotle's become kind of wide and loose and crazy. Um, but yeah, it's in trouble. I just prefer to short it coming off of uh, well, it is off all time highs. I'll be darned. Yeah, it it's just kind of crazy, but I hear you. Uh, and I think it's in trouble. It pretty much closed the gap in here. I don't know. I think I'd probably pass, but uh, if I had to say up or down, I'd say definitely down. And maybe wait for a tiny bit of a pullback. It's it's tricky. You got a little bit of support here. It's just not cut and dry, but yeah, I think I think it's in trouble. ATRA, did we cover that one? ATRA. Yeah, we covered that one. That's a buy. AAC, we covered that one. Okay. Any more? Let's see what the high on that was. Okay, while we're in an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, of course, you can shoot me an email. We'll give it uh, two more. RCL is a short. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we talked about that one already, didn't we? Yeah, we did. SRT? No, okay. All right, well, let's go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, anything? Okay, Intel, fine. One, one last one, Intel. Intel's a big, thick company. I'm not super excited about trading it. But every now and then, something big and thick like the Micron will set up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Intel looks like it's in trouble in here. Uh, a little lower in EHV. Again, a big, thick stock. Not my absolute favorite to trade. But it's retraced back up to this gap in here. I think it's in a lot of trouble. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap things up. We're right about that time. Looks like the, the questions have... Um, if crawled, slow to a crawl or whatever. Uh, anyway, any other unanswered questions? He tried to say, shoot me an email, David, Dave Lander com. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. We'll talk again, and hopefully, we'll see all you guys again next week. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you.